cash flowing rentals, ultimately everybody wants to be here so that you can build up your net worth and your residual income. Now let's think about it. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on fixed and flips because I think a lot of you understand that. Uh, you buy low, you sell kind of high. I've never been buy low, sell a top dollar. I've been always buy low, sell below top dollar because I'm all about get in, get out, get paid type of guy. But um, here, think about it. I mean, if you did three flips for the year and you averaged $20,000, that's 60 grand at the end of the year. Can anybody in here use an extra 60 grand? Oh, just three of you raise hands and about four of you nod heads. You're a bunch of liars, but you are. We could all use an extra 60 grand. I mean, shoot, what about an extra 20 grand? Yes, we can. What if we just eliminated a, one, a zero over here? Can we make an extra six? I take an extra 600 bucks tonight, right now. So we can use the extra cash. We can use the extra cash. Is this out of the norm? Absolutely not out of the norm. Okay. So we can use the extra money. So you're going to be fixing and flipping to be able to build that cash machine that you need to where you can parlay that money over into your buy and hold instead of reaching into retirements or having to get that second job. Now let's take a look at two options here. We've got lease options and we have seller financing. There's a difference between the two and there's some similarities. The lease option means rent to own. Someone is going to rent as a tenant slash buyer and have the option to purchase that property at the end of the term at an agreed upon price. Now they don't, they don't have to buy, they're not obligated to do so, but they have the option. Think of it as like leasing a car. You can go in and you gotta find the car that you want, you get to test drive it, you get to Take it home, you act like it's yours, you gotta wash it, you gotta fuel it, you gotta change the oil, but once that 30, what is it, 36 to 38 months comes up, you gotta make a decision. Am I gonna buy this or am I going to give it back? So we do the same thing with houses. It's the exact same thing. Seller financing, a little bit different. You actually are acquiring a buyer for your property. Many people invest in notes, right? Everybody's familiar with notes. You, you buy a discounted note or people pool their money together as a joint venture or syndication. They buy a bunch of notes and you make this residual income. That's great. And it's very passive and that's good because you'll, you, you're already working 60, 70 hours a week. But the thing is, is that many times when you invest in notes, you don't really know the property or properties that you're investing in. You're leaving it up to the person that did the syndication. That's okay, but that's being a little too passive for me. I want to know what I'm investing my money in. I want to know who my buyer is. I want to know where the money's going at all times. I'm not that passive investor. So instead of buying notes that you don't really know what you're buying, why not buy a house in an area that you like, a house that you like, on a tenant, or a, a, I'm sorry, a buyer that you like, and then step out of that position and just become the bank and let them make you mortgage payments. The biggest benefit here is that if you ever have to foreclose on them, you get a house that you like in an area that you like. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you have complete control. Oh, but wait, who really has control? If a buyer picks up a property, if a buyer picks up a property, who gets the deed? Think about it. Have anybody ever bought a house before and got a loan? Mm -hmm. bank. Does Bank of America get the deed or does the buyer get the deed? Bank no, America. you get the deed. They have the note. You have the deed. One's a promise and one wow. is holding the gold. That's why your name is on title when you check public records, right? We got to come back and teach seller financing, okay? So. Here's the thing, I'm not that type of investor. I'm not as dumb as Bank of America is saying, here, hey, you know what, I'll give you a lot of money to go buy this house and take the deed too. Here's the problem with that. You gotta foreclose. Is foreclosure expensive? Yes. Oh, it's very expensive. The bank's gotta spend a lot of money to foreclose on people. And they have a non-performing asset. But the way I do seller financing is that I give you all the rights if you're gonna buy my property. I give you all the rights, tax benefits, you live in it, it's your house, you can do whatever you want with it, I don't care, it's your house. 
but you miss a payment, the way I do seller financing, we're not foreclosing. I just evict you out. You know why? Because I have the deed. I have the deed. Think about it. When you buy that car from, you know, where do you work? Which one? So what's the most popular car? You don't know? BMW. BMW, okay. Actually, I was, I was just looking at the BMW today. Um, so you go to the BMW lot, right? And you buy that car with a loan attached to it. Do you get the pink slip on the spot? No. You don't get the pink slip until you what? Pay it off. Why? Because that way they can easily come repossess it back. Well, again, we're going to think more like the auto dealers. That way, if someone does not make payments, it's much cheaper and a faster process just to kick them out than it is to do a foreclosure. You guys with me on that? Yes. Okay, we want to be smart investors. Okay, so here's the benefits. There's three ways to make cash when we're working with lease options, seller financing. We're going to make cash up front, we'll make money in the middle, and we're going to make a lot of money on the back end. What do I mean by that? Well, up in front, on the lease option side, we're going to require an option consideration fee an option consideration fee. And when you're doing a lease option with an option consideration fee, I want you to write this down, non-refundable, okay? That gives them the right to purchase your property at a later date. I do not do lease options where they just get to step in and not give me any money. If that's the case where you're doing that, it's because you're in a low-income neighborhood. Nothing wrong with low-income neighborhoods, but that's not the best strategy for me in that type of neighborhood. I want money up front. Because if I require, let's just say, 3,500 bucks, that's 3,500 reasons why they're going to keep that property in good condition, okay? Non-refundable. Now, on the seller financing side, we don't have an option consideration because they're actually becoming the buyer. They are going to give us a down payment. Now, the difference between the two is that typically your tenant slash buyer that's doing a lease option is doing a lease option for several different reasons. So just to name a few is that maybe their credit's no good, but they're cash rich. Maybe they've got a little bit of credit, but not so good enough to get a good loan, and they got a little bit of money. Maybe they have great credit, and they have a lot of money, but they're not sure if they're gonna to wanna to stay in this neighborhood because they got relocated due to a job. Who knows what the reason may be? But what I typically do is I follow the guidelines of FHA. What does FHA require in regards to a down payment? Does anybody know? Three and a half percent. So that's typically my guidelines, about three and a half percent to five percent. I will go up to ten percent, but I'm in a much nicer neighborhood. Now on a down payment, I typically generally target about ten percent. And when I say three and a half and ten percent, we're really focused on properties that are going to be in the market median or a little bit less. Okay? Because if we're going to step up to a strong middle income or white collar neighborhood, these numbers are going up. Okay? But that's typically not where investors are doing these te techniques. They're in the market median or a little bit less. Now, here's the benefits of the seller. If I go buy a property and I fix it up and maybe cost me 2,500 bucks in rehab, I just collected 3,500, I just made $1,000 back <coughs> and I recoup some of my expenses. Make sense? Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes, you guys with me? Yes. Okay, is the wine kicking in? Is that the problem? <laughs> Okay, so we're making some money, we're getting some money right back into our pocket. Now, as the buyer, what's their benefit? Well, you know what? They basically get to test drive the property. And so on a lease option, they have a low down, it should be a low deposit. They're working towards ownership. They're cleaning up their credit. They're building up their down payment. They are making their rental payments along the way. <coughs> and on the seller financing side, well, they actually become the owner. They get to live the American dream. They got to step right into a deal to where they just had to come with a down payment but with no credit. Do those deals happen today? Yes, they do. Can I share a little story with you real quick? I had a lady, um, a, lady a Chinese lady, um, that goes back and forth about every four months from China to here. She actually resides here, but her parents still live over there. She's in her mid-60s, and she had uh, bought a bunch of properties from a lot of different California networks all over the states. And so she had bought this one property over in Indianapolis, and she bought it from me. And so she wanted me to rehab it, which I did, and her goal was to put that property up on the market as a rental property. Well, with the bad choices she made in the other states, she just found a couple of arrows in her assets, is what she did. 
And so she was in a distressed situation. And she goes, I need to unload this property right away. I'm like, we're right in the dead of winter right now. I don't think we're going to be able to sell it for what you're asking for. Nonetheless, she says, you know what, why don't you just take it over for me? I said, what do you mean? She goes, why don't you buy the house for me? I said, okay. The house is worth $80,000 at the time. It's just a little over a year ago. This is the end of 2011, 2012, the end of 2012. So it's worth $80,000 on this house, fully renovated. I mean, everything, plumbing, heating, everything. Fully renovated in a nice neighborhood. It pulls in $800 a month in rents. So I go ahead and I buy this property from her for $70,000 at 6.5% interest with no money down, no credit checks, no income verification, and I make a $442 a month mortgage payment and I collect $800. Is that a good deal? Yeah. It's all about distress. If you don't have the big D word, distress, then you don't have a deal. Okay? And we've got lots of people out there just like that. Nonetheless, these deals happen all the time. So the seller financing may become owner. Just like me, I maxed out on loans in regards to what I can, what I can acquire. So my choice is I gotta get private money, use my own money, or find someone just like her to keep building the portfolio, okay? The second way to make money is on the lease option is a rental premium. What does that mean? Well, let's say, for instance, everybody in here, we all live, I'm sorry, we're all investors and we all own rental properties in the same subdivision. And everybody's collecting about 800 bucks a month on average. Okay, that's market rents. You're all happy with that because you're making, you know, maybe a seven and eight percent cap rate, and I'm happy with 800 bucks. Not really. So I'm going to go ahead and do a lease option, and tack on a rental premium. Well, when that tenant comes in, a tenant slash buyer, they give me the option consideration fee. That goes into my pocket. They don't get that back, and they decide to walk away. But I'm also going to charge them market rents. But on top of that market rents, I'm going to have a rental premium, maybe an extra 200 bucks. So now they have to pay a thousand dollars a month. Why in the heck would they pay a thousand dollars a month? Because they're not just normal tenants; they're working towards ownership. Now that two hundred dollars a month equates to be twenty-four hundred bucks at the end of the year, forty-eight hundred dollars at the end of two years. You know what I just did? I just made twenty-four hundred dollars at the end of the year more than all of you just did. To me, twenty-four hundred dollars versus your measly eight hundred dollars is a huge difference there. And so I've just increased my cash flow. And I've just increased my cap rates. However, you're into it for the long term. That's okay. You're into it for the long haul. I'm only going to be in this for maybe for one to two years max. Okay? On the other side, we can still make that $1,000 a month payment. Because when you have someone doing seller financing and their credit just stinks, and they've been raked over because they weren't making payments, and they possibly lost a house during the recession, well, they have an opportunity to come in and step in and buy this new home, but they're going to put 10% down. They can do that. No problem. That goes right in my pocket. They don't get that back. But I'm going to make sure that I make that $1,000 a month because think about it. If people have poor credit, are they used to going down to the BMW dealership and getting 0.9% financing or 29.9% financing? Yeah. Are they going to get the same low rates of 4% for your mortgage today or are they going to get more like an 8 or 10% mortgage? Well, they can't get a mortgage, so we'll provide the mortgage for them. Come on in. We'll hold the note for you, but you're going to be paying whatever your magic percentage is. Most are paying about 10% right now for seller financing. So I'm going to still make my 10. I'm still going to make my thousand dollars. Now, the benefits to the seller is this: you're now increased your cash flow. You just injected steroids into your cash flow. You are now beating out your competition and all your other competitions hating you because you're making that extra more uh, that extra money that they're not making. So the, the benefit to the buyer on the lease option side is that, that monthly premium, that rental money that's coming in, that $800 gets set aside for rental, but that extra $200 a month is going to go to one or two things, whichever they prefer. It'll go towards a principal pay down on the purchase price of the property, or it can go as a credit towards their down payment wherever they need it to be placed. And they can be split in both. Most of the time what I find is it's going to be reducing their principal. Okay? Now, on the seller financing side, their benefit is the principal pay down. They bought the property from you, they're paying you, you know, principal and interest. Maybe you're only charging them interest only to make the deal work. But most times it's principal and interest, so they're dropping down that uh, principal balance. And now that they're making payments to you, 
They have a seasoning going on. They have a seasoning of ownership, and they have a seasoning, a track record of the payments that they're making to you. And in the meantime, you've got both of these buyers right here on some credit restoration program, so when it's time for them to pay out, you can get them a loan. Typically, on the lease option side, we'll hold it one to three years on average right now. On the seller financing, people that are doing seller financing like to do one, three, five, seven, and ten years. You can hold it 30 years if you want. I mean, most of the banks are going to 40 years now, right? You know what mortgage means, right? It's a Latin word. To death. That's what it means. It's a Latin word. To death. You will pay till you die. Okay? That's why they're extending it. And is it no joke? No joke. Okay? That's the Latin word. So, anyways, uh, you got the principal pay down. Now, the third way to make money is on the back end. You're going to sell that property. You're going to sell that lease option for retail value. You're selling that uh, property and you're selling on the seller financing side retail value. The seller gets cashed out, so all that money that we sold it for from the price that we put into it to the sales price is now ours. That goes into our pocket. The buyer now has ownership and any appreciation. So let's say, for instance, we, have, we sold to him for 100 grand. Are we in an appreciating market right now? Yes, I predict that we're going to, you know, I predicted last November that we'll hit a 20% appreciation rate here in California. Okay? Now, if by the end of the year we buy a $100,000 property, it's going to be worth 120000 right? So they get that $20,000, that's theirs. That's a huge benefit. It helps them qualify for a loan much easier, too, by the way. Okay? So I want to make sure that I'm providing them good deals. I got what I want, they got what they want, and they have the ability to get out of the deal if they want to, meeting with me. Okay? Now, here are some reasons to buy and hold cash flow rentals. Now, that's the biggest buzzword for the last five years, six years. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. That's what everybody wants. Okay? I don't think it's the biggest asset when it comes to real estate, to be honest. I think it's just more of a buzzword and people get hooked up on it because really what you need is paydays, paydays, paydays. And that's why you're looking at cash flow. Okay? But when I see someone that's looking at cash flow, they're really looking to do one thing. They're looking to eliminate their J-O-B and bring in these residential properties or multi-units to replace that income. I'm not into replacing my income. I'm into building my income. There's a difference there. I mean, I look at my father-in-law. I won't look at my mom and dad because they're broke. I'll be honest. With you. That's on YouTube, huh? <laughs> they're broke. But my, my father-in-law that did very well in business, he's at that retirement age where he thinks, let's get rid of the Mercedes and go to a Camry. Let's go from our beautiful home to just, you know, 1,500 square foot. Everything is on the downsides. And I'm thinking, maintenance-wise, that might be smart, but... When I retire, should I really be downsizing? Or should my net worth still be growing? There's a difference there. It's the mentality of where people have been trained over the years in the past. And I don't think any of us should downsize. I think we should always be growing, okay? And to be, do that, you're gonna need these three components right there. People are after the cash flow. That's not my number one. My number one criteria is appreciation. And write this down. This appreciation is the quickest path to wealth. <coughs> it is the quickest path to wealth. Think about it. All of us here have invested in something with our money. Stocks, mutual funds, CDs, savings, whatever it may be. But when you put your money into something and you want it to grow, and we're back 10 years, or ahead of 10 years right now, do you want the money that you put in 10 years ago to be the same? Ten years later? Why the heck are people buying properties up in the Detroit area and buying properties at the same price they were 40 years ago? It doesn't make any sense. we got to buy properties that will appreciate because I want my money to double. Now, I was, I was with two gentlemen this past week, and they're clients of mine. And fortunately, I landed a deal to where they gave me permission to spend $10 million on their behalf on real estate. So I'm out there shopping for real estate. I know it's a hard job. But we'll shop for real estate, and we're going to find them properties. Now, I was sitting down with him, and he's exactly my age. He's liquid about $28.5 million. And he says, you know what, real estate's, you know, real estate's fun for me, but that's not really how I make my money. If I cannot double my money in two or three years, then I'm not investing my money in it. However, why is he choosing real estate now? He's choosing real estate now because it's got lower taxes. 
He's choosing real estate now because he's getting to the point where he doesn't have to work so hard to double that money every two years. He'll put his money in areas that will double every seven to ten years instead. Okay? Think about all the big businesses out there. Did they really make their money from real estate? No, Microsoft, no, nope. Dell, no. Nope. But where do they park their money? Where do they park their money? They put their money, they're buying islands, they're buying mansions, they're buying houses, you know, they're buying multi-units, they're parking their money in real estate. But they park their money in areas that appreciate. Do you, you think those guys are out parking their money in, in the Rust Belt or in areas that just don't appreciate? No, they're not. So we focus on areas that appreciate. Then we also have to have cash flow. We don't want to take any negatives. We want a cash flow for sure. And then we want to be able to take the tax deductions. And so I have some white collar workers that say, hey, you know what, so they, I think this is the number one thing for me. I've got a huge cash machine going right now and I just need, I need to lower my ordinary income bracket. And so I need to park some money in some real estate. And so some people say this is the best, some people say that's the best, some people say that's the best. But to be honest, if you're looking at an investment and you're doing your calculated risk and you're going to be buying and holding, then you need to have all three because that is your absolute wealth builder. If you don't have all three components, you will not have wealth building. You'll have residual income. Let me tell you something, there's nothing, there's nothing passive about residual income. It's a business. Okay? You'll have maybe just appreciation with negatives. Well, that's, that's tough because then you're always having to feed that kitty. Okay? And if you're just after tax deductions, that's because you're using some other type of vehicle to make your money. But if you really want to build that wealth, you need all three right there. So let's take a look at the tail of tape. Let's measure up. Okay? So we've got the terms on the left-hand side. Can't see, I'll just run through them real quick. Monthly income, premium, uh, annual gross income, option, consideration, sales price, and term. Then we've got the rentals, <laughs> lease option, the seller financing. What we don't have up here is flips. We know about flips. We buy them, we fix them, we flip them, we make money. Okay? So on the rental side, if we go on monthly income, everybody's making $800 a month, remember? In the same subdivision. That's great. Same thing with lease option. We're making $800 bucks a month. But on the, on the rental side, there's no premium because you're into it for the long term. Uh, annual gross income, you're making about $9,300 a year. Option consideration, there isn't one. There's no deposits you're taking except for maybe a security deposit, and that's going to be given back anyways. There's no sales price because you're banking this property. There's absolutely nothing wrong with number one because that's where we all want to be, is on the rental side. Now, if we skip over to the lease option side, we're still getting the $800 a month of rents, but the difference here is that we got a $200 a month premium. So we're collecting an extra $200 a month, which is $2,400 at the end of the year. Now, when we measure that up, we look at the annual gross, and that's $9,300 compared to $12,000. I don't know which one tickles you a little bit better, the $9,300 or the $12,000, but for me, the $12,000 does it for me. Option consideration fee, not on the rental side, but we've got $3,500 on the lease option, and let's say we have a sales price of $73,700. Now, does that mean that's what we purchased it for? Absolutely not. We bought it for a lot less, maybe 20 grand less, for an example. And we're going to get 20 on the back end. Okay? We'll hold that for one to three years. Now we go over to the seller finance side, and you may say, you know what? I really don't want to be a landlord. I don't want to handle the lease options. I don't want to rent properties and deal with tents and toilets. I would rather just park my money somewhere and just collect the mortgage payments. That's cool. Okay? We're going to make sure that you get that premium in the area because typically we're selling people that don't have the credit but do have the employment and the cash. You know who's famous that has great cash flow and poor credit? My friends. They're doctors. They've got terrible credit and they've got all the cash. So they're perfect ones that to sell to on the higher end spectrum. Premium, there isn't any but on the, because um, uh, that only applies to the lease option. Annual gross, 12000 just like the lease option because we have that thousand dollars there. The option consideration, well, that's for the lease option, but we're going to collect seventy-three hundred dollars down. That's ten percent of the sales price, which is seventy-three-seven, and that should actually say one plus years because investors will do one, three, five, seven, and ten, and balloon it at, at the end of that term. So there's different options here in different scenarios. Now, if you're in a slow market and you already own property, gosh, the lease option is a great way to go. It's a good way to collect. Increase. In fact, I've got lots of people that come to me and say, you know, I bought back in 2004, five, six, seven. You know, and I'm taking these negatives and I'm running them out, and yeah, I'm negative about 200 bucks. Switch on a lease option. Get the extra 200 bucks. Now it's a break even. You don't have to worry about. It. Okay. Oh, I'm upside down equity. Did you buy in an area that actually appreciates? Because that'll be gobbled up real quick. You know, we were buying newer houses in Phoenix back in 2008. 
28,000, 35,000, built in 2007. Those properties today, 120 plus, okay? Just in a short period of time. So are you buying them right? Are you buying them in the correct locations? On, on the lease options, can I answer your question? Sure. If I was doing lease options, technically, I want to have my tenant, uh, my tenant buyer as a renter. So there's gonna be my deposit, including my lease option fee, and I'm collecting Your the deposit. deductions. Okay, yeah. So, do you pass on the deductions? Because nope. I know you mentioned that you give your tenant buyer the deductions. No, I do not give the tenant buyer any deductions because they're not an owner. Okay. I only give my seller financing buyers mm -hmm. the deductions. So it's a pass on. So, yes. The cool thing about a lease option, depending on which state mm -hmm. you're in, is that it does relieve you of some landlordship duties. California is not landlord friendly, okay, they're tenant friendly. But the laws do change in your favor when you're actually doing lease options because they're coming in as a tenant slash buyer. And so there are no benefits passed on to the tenant slash buyer until they actually own the property. Okay? You keep all of that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Okay? Good question. All right, so here's some of the areas that we focus on across the states. Um, you know, I've focused on, like I said, back in 1995, Florida all the way to Hawaii. We move around depending on which technique works the best and gives the best returns for our investors. We're in Phoenix, Southern California, Las Vegas. These are the triangle states that are very, very similar. What I mean is similar is that we're all appreciating states. We hit the hardest and we fell the hardest, okay? Um, the Phoenix and Las Vegas market are very close. They're like mirror markets. And what I mean by that is we're looking at the same climate, we're looking at the same rental market, we're looking at the same purchase prices, prices. we're looking at the same product, the same type of houses. The difference here between the two is Phoenix is a much better economy. It's a diverse economy versus Vegas. It's a very linear economy, okay? Linear meaning there's not a whole lot there except for tourism. And tourism is there for gambling. If gambling is down, everything else falls down like domino effect, okay? Just being up front with you, okay? Phoenix is completely diverse in regards to its economy. It's a growing economy and didn't get hit very hard in their economy back in 2007 and 8 either. Southern California, well, you know, when we hit the appreciation back in the day, it was Las Vegas first. They climbed all the way up to 52% or 49%, whatever it was, fell down, and that second wave came, in, came along over to Phoenix about nine months later and started charging up and then fell right back down. And Southern California was the third one. They got the third set of waves and came up and came back down. Well, the very first recovering market is Phoenix out of the three, and then Southern, Cal <coughs> Southern Northern California, and then Las Vegas is the third. So very similar in regards to the type of markets that we're in. Um, all three in a recovery stage right now. We've got Kansas City, Missouri, and Indianapolis, Indiana, which are mirror markets. Again, same type of climate, same type of economy, same type of diversity, same type of uh, rental um, uh, rates, same type of purchase prices, same type of product. And then we have Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio is up more north. And this is a good area if you're just strictly looking for cash flow. Now, I'm not really big on Rust Belt areas. The only reason I have Cleveland in here is because for the last year and a half, they've been going through an economic boom. They have been diversifying over there. They're different from Detroit. Detroit solely lows on, uh, relies on the automotive industry, where Cleveland supplies the parts to the automotive industry. However, they've changed their game, and they're now supplying their parts to other manufacturing, to aircrafts, to ship, they're doing a whole lot of stuff. And so they've, uh, their rental rates have gone up, their vacancy factor has gone down, so they're actually doing pretty darn good. Keyword so, fracking. good, I'm sorry? sorry? Keyword fracking. Keyword fracking. <laughs> <laughs> so here in Cleveland, Ohio, it's a great place to be able to get a turnkey property for 30 grand, okay? That's why people are going there, because they just want the cash flow. These two areas, well, they'll experience some appreciation because they're always right at par. Sometimes they jump up a little higher. Sometimes they dip down a little bit. Great cash flow, great products, and a very diverse economy. Kansas City is like the hub of the United States for the trucking industry. Indianapolis is the fastest growing city east of the Mississippi. So I'm not going to talk about all those areas, but I'm going to break down two. So we'll take a look at Kansas City, Missouri. I'm not going to read all the stats to you if you want. I'd be more than happy to email them over to you. But just know, it's the largest city in Missouri. The government is the largest employer in Kansas City, Missouri as well. A um, whole lot of stuff going on. 
uh, colleges and universities just right where we want to be. Now let's go through this property here because this is actually a recent deal. This is a house that we picked up in a little town called Liberty. And we got this directly from the bank and we picked it up and sold it to one of our investors for $33,000. Now it's an old house that's actually been sitting vacant for eight years. The bank had it on their books and no 